Thank you, uh, Jeremy. That was excellent. Um, Becky McLean um, is a molecular biologist for 23 years. Uh, she is the nation's first successful biolab whistleblower. <laughs> she has lived a lot with your Jeremy just was talking about. Um, and um, she's become one of the most powerful advocates we have for worker safety and for public health associated with this technology. Stevens from the Alliance for Humane Biotechnology. Uh, these are very important issues. I come from Connecticut, uh, so uh, I've come a long way to give you a message. Pull to the mic. about a dangerous situation that is crippling people's lives without concern because of a lack of protection for biotech workers and the public. Fifteen years ago, a 22-year-old woman employed at a bio research facility went to her employer's emergency room. Her eye had become red and swollen. She informed the doctor that she had incurred an exposure through a splash in her eye to a possible simian herpes B virus. She was worried. You see, a B virus infection is 60% fatal in humans. And the best option for survival is immediate antiviral therapy. But the ER doctor concluded that an infection from her exposure was unlikely and sent her home with some eye drops. After failed attempts to obtain an appointment with an infectious disease doctor, this young woman desperately went from doctor to doctor who sent her home and neglected to test her for her occupational exposures. Fifteen days after her exposure to work, at work, suffering with excruciating pain and a high fever, she was finally hospitalized where she tested positive for the B virus infection. Des despite treatment in the hospital, her condition deteriorated. The secular eruptions occurred on her face. The virus began to demyelate her spinal cord, causing sharp pain, sharp spinal pain, and other body pain. She then began to experience, experience flaccid paralysis, seizures, pneumonia, <coughs> respiratory distress, and finally death 45 days after her biological exposure at work. The lack of immediate and quality medical care for injured biotech workers is sadly not uncommon. And even more concerning is that many injured workers who become exposed and ill from advanced biotechnologies like those used within synthetic biology will be completely denied directed medical care for their exposure. I know, because that is what happened to me. In 2003, while working as a scientist in an embryonic stem cell, biosafety level two lab at Pfizer, I incurred hostility and retaliation for raising safety issues, only one of which was the unsafe biocontainment of sample, samples containing the same type of B virus that killed the young biotech worker just described. Des despite my complaints, the unaddressed safety issues resulted in my exposure to a genetically engineered virus that was used at Pfizer without proper biocontainment. My exposure led to a frightful, painful, and debilitating illness that resulted in numerous ambulance rides, ER visits, and hospitalization. When my physician and I requested exposure records for the identity of the virus for my health care, I was denied by Pfizer. Pfizer claimed that trade secrets superseded my right to these records. OSHA and Connecticut Workers' Compensation agreed with Pfizer's position and also denied me legal access to these essential records needed for my health care. It was not only the lack of human dignity and lack of human rights that shocked and appalled me, but I soon discovered that the current regulatory framework 
that was supposed to guide the biotech industry to protect workers and the public was only a facade. It does not protect workers, it does not protect the public, and it surely did not protect me. All levels of regulatory agencies from state to federal failed in oversight. OSHA refused to perform a safety inspection in my department, even after I had provided documents which showed exposures, employee illness, and serious biocontainment problems, like the discovery of an infectious agent, infectious genetically engineered vi virus found in our break area where we eat and drink. I was told that I had no rights to demand a safety form advisor to address and remedy our numerous serious safety concerns and it was, that it was completely legal that Pfizer had told me to stop documenting my safety complaints within the safety committee. <laughs> Both OSHA and the state said nothing could be done when Pfizer emitted a mystery agent from a biocontainment hood which was known to make people sick into the air of our local community. I soon discovered that this failure of regulatory oversight came not only about from weak regulatory laws, but also involved unscrupulous relationships that exist within the government, academia, and corporate networks that align to hide unsafe work conditions. Unsafe work conditions and biological <coughs> exposures to workers in the biotech industry go underreported. Not only is there no national database tracking laboratory acquired infections or, il il or illness, but most often workers become coerced into signing confidentiality agreements in exchange for health care or compensation for their injury. Despite this lack of transparency, it has been shown that unsafe biocontainment of human infectious agents do occur within the research community, as evidenced by horrible deaths and injuries. Yet our scientific leadership continue to deny the truth that advanced recombinant DNA technologies like synthetic biology can pose, can pose a significant public health and safety threat. Even recently, in advocating for self-regulation, Synthetic biologists were allowed to publish in the prestigious journal Science erroneous and unethical statements that give the impression that after 40 years, biotechnology remains completely safe. I tell you, it is a lie. And you will hear stories from other injured workers tonight who also know it is a lie. Synthetic biology in, engages in advanced technologies, including the development of infectious agents. Current BL2 technologies can transform an innocuous agent into a human infectious agent with capabilities to attack through your eyes, when you breathe, through ingestion, and also to a broad spectrum of other species. These and other technologies can cause a wide variety of known illness and even more alarming new undiagnosable illness. Unimaginable human suffering and ecological disasters could occur if these advanced technologies are not biocontained and tested for safety. Public health and safety cannot be safeguarded today when we have allowed the scientific industry to be police, judge, and jury. We are in a battle today to get legal protections to save us from a lack of concern for workers, communities, and public health and safety. Local community grassroots efforts who call out for transparency and demand protections can make a significant difference. If not, one day you may be left holding your child or your spouse who has de developed a mystery illness or cancer and wonder why. Consider this, if this scientific industry denies the rights to biotech workers for exposure records for directed health care, what rights do you think you will have when one of these dangerous technologies escapes into your community? Take action. It is your only option for protection. Thank you. so much, Becky. 
Uh, we're really privileged to have this next speaker. Um, Nima Bassi is really one of the leading act activist campaigners for human rights and environment in all of Africa. And in uh, honor of that, he was uh, given the Right Livelihood Award in 2010, which is often called the Alternate Nobel Prize. Some of us think the Nobel Prize should be called the Alternate Nobel Prize, but <laughs> this should be the real Nobel Prize. Uh, he's chair of uh, Friends of the Earth International and uh, also one of the most amazing people in our movement. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, friends. Good evening, in laws and outlaws. <laughs> um, after hearing these presentations, I get more concerned about synthetic biology. Starting from the fact that the oil companies who are ravaging populations and communities around the world, starting from Chevron and going to BP, Exxon Mobil, Shell. These are the top investors in this very unpredictable and dangerous technology. I come from a community that is devastated by oil spills and gas flares from Chevron. <coughs> and it's in Chevron's, uh, we, we talk about in a new laboratory proposed for the Richmond area where Chevron has put his talons and claws over the years, devastating people who live in that area, and they want to do even more predictable things. I'm really worried that this, this narrative may be allowed to, to be constructed, to be set up, and expose the people to more, more danger. Now, <laughs> when I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, when I think about genetic, genetically engineered crops, mm. I ask the question, well, who needs GMOs? And some, you know, some people think that you could genetically engineer crops to make them look beautiful, to make fish glow, to make even you know, certain animals begin to do things that they ought not to do. <laughs> and maybe even produce a banana that is straight. But who wants a straight banana? <laughs> now, with regard to synthetic biology, the, one of the areas that they would want to um, exploit would be the generation, produ production of a new generation of biofuel. The first generation power fuel did not live up to its promise because it required more energy to produce the fuel than the fuel will give you. And you would not have enough land on earth to produce a crops that would meet the energy, the, the dramatic appetite for energy, for fossil fuels and other kinds of fuel that the world currently demands. And even with the hype that you could use biomass to produce this fuel, you will see the required land, as you saw in James' uh, presentation, you need biomass in the tropics. And you're going to require more than the biomass that we have in our forest to, generate, to produce enough biofuels, even just to meet the biofuel requirements of the aviation industry. Uh, in today's San Francisco Chronicle, that professor who's also a business tycoon <laughs> said that the stuff that we needed for biofuel production would be useless materials in wastelands where nothing would grow except switch grass <laughs> that's used for nothing. But we need to remind ourselves that the so-called wasteland is somebody's land. And the so-called marginal land is land that is very useful for pastoralists, for small-scale farmers, and for people who are adapted, who, who have adapted the environment to suit their means, their, their ways of life. Mm -hmm. People do live in the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. People live in the Kalahari Desert. Mm -hmm. And I believe people live in deserts right here in the United States. So there's no territory that is a wasteland. 
The Colombia made a wasteland by maybe military invasion. And here the US military, they do seminars on environmental, environment friendly warfare. <laughs> I mean, I've heard of many of them around, just like Clinco. So the, this kind of pretentious classifications of land is actually a guise to grab lands, displace farmers, create more hunger, and create more conflicts in the world. And we believe that this is, this sort of talk and pretensions must be exposed for what they are so that we can resist the expansion and secure the human rights and the prevent the rights of our peoples across the world. When GMOs were introduced, we were given a lot of promises. Better yield, less pesticides, less herbicides, more nutritious crops. They have not delivered on any of those promises. And yet, there's a lot of pressure to expose and open up territories that have been free of GMOs up to this time. Just because if my own land is polluted, I better get everybody's land polluted. If I can pollute and grab the market, I want to grab markets everywhere. And so they pollute and then get approval because what can you do when your territory is already polluted? This kind of taking over territories by state is something that needs to be combated very vigorously. I will conclude very shortly, but let's look at how rabbits were introduced to Australia. Somebody said, Thomas Austin said in 1859, just imported 24 rabbits to, from England to Victoria. He said, the introduction of a few rabbits could do little harm and might provide a touch of home, in addition to a spot of hunting. Within a few years, farmers had to abandon their properties in face of rabbit plagues in some places. Just 31 years after they were overrun by farms, farmers were overrun by rabbits. 40 to 100 years later, overgrazing by rabbits, sheep, and cattle led to unintended ecosystem effects, land degradation, dust storms, some of which uh, destroyed homesteads, killed children, and caused a lot of problems in communities. Now, they had to resort to shooting the rabbit, trapping, poisoning, fencing, using labor intensive and ineffective, many, many things tried to do were quite ineffective. But in 1951, there was biological control of rabbits through introduction of the virus disease, uh, myosomatosis. And then they were able to reduce rabbits from 60 to 100 million. Well, you know, there's a big difference between rabbits and artificial life forms that are microbes. If you see a rabbit, you know the rabbit is a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to see this synthetic life form. And if it was difficult to control rabbits that are big and could be seen, I believe it would be a major disaster if we open up our lands to life forms that are very unpredictable, uh, quite unscientific. Uh, I like to call GMOs cowboy technology. Yep. They, use the, they use the gun to shoot. And there are a lot of problems that we have to, to, to confront. Talk again about massive the land grabs in the world and the, the scramble for Africa and resources in the tropics. You can see where all the, this equates the territory that, that, that look green from space and where uh, the powerful industry want, want to go. And the whole purpose is to service the insatiable appetites of rich countries in Europe, North America, Japan, and Australia. There must be a way forward. There has to be a time when humanity begins to regain its memory of being human. There must be a time when we know that we have only planet Earth and there's no planet B. We must get to a time when we can we should agree that even if there's another planet somewhere, it will take more than one lifetime to fly there. And we have to get to a time when we know that when we agree that competition will not get us anywhere, it's going to generate more conflict, more wars, and more destruction. We've got to get to a time when we agree that war and equating energy as national security would not solve the problems of our time. I would have to also agree that we are not in, on this planet just for ourselves, that there are future generations if we allow them to come. We have to do something.
Uh, at this point, I have to admit I have failed as a moderator. Uh, we are at least 15 minutes behind. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask the other moderators to be a lot better than I've been, very hypocritically. And also those who've spoken already who are going to speak again, maybe to limit their comments so that we can protect your, your chance at the end of this to, to, um, to ask your questions. And remember, remember you got your little cards? JD, where are you, JD? JD is over here. Okay, so you can go around and collect the cards. I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Steve Zeltzer. We're going to talk more about the front lines, which is the, the, the folks that will actually be working with these, with these genetically engineered organisms, synthetic biology organisms. So Steve. Thank you, brothers and sisters. And uh, this is an historic meeting today, historic conference, which is actually the first time to bring together the workers who are developing the technology in the biotech industry with other environmental movement, including farm workers and workers around the world who work in the agriculture. So this is very important to make this connection. Uh, one other point is that uh, there was coverage, fortunately, for this conference from the Chronicle and the Contra Costa Times. There wasn't coverage from KQED. And we invited KQED to our press conference yesterday. I contacted Forum, Michael Krasny, and surprise, surprise, no response. Now, it might be because Pfizer and some of these companies contributed to KQED. Maybe that's not why they're interested in covering, which is an important local, regional, and national, and international story about the development of synthetic technology and the fact that this industry is now centered in Northern California. So we do have to thank KPFA for streaming this live. <laughs> and presentations here tonight and also presentations which were made during the day will be available uh, on a file so that people can come and get them because the purpose of our meeting here is to educate ourselves, to learn from other people, and to get a grasp of what we're facing in the development of new technology. So what we're going to start with in this panel is the issue of health and safety and what are the conditions of biotech workers uh, in the Bay Area and nationally. And uh, the first question, I'm going to ask a number of questions to the different panels here, uh, is uh, the question of California OSHA, which is supposed to protect the health and safety of workers. There are 18 million workers in California. And we have with us a doctor, a longtime advocate for health and safety in California. He was at one time the last doctor at Cal OSHA. Now there is one doctor for 18 million workers. So welcome, Dr. Larry Rose. <laughs> Yeah, I, w I worked for Cal OSHA for 28 years as the senior medical director. And uh, I won't go into the history of how it's become less functional once the years have gone by, maybe with de-staffing. Uh, let me just brief you on that quickly, and then I'll tell you some good news. Cal OSHA at, sorry. In California, which one is they oh, both working? This one. Okay. Cal OSHA is responsible for 18. Well, oh, maybe you can stand up too. This one. Cal OSHA is responsible for 18 million workers uh, in the state of California. When I, when I came on board, there were 11 million workers. The problem is that there's been no increased staffing for the enforcement component of Cal OSHA. So at present, we have one compliance officer, or one enforcement officer, for 90,000 workers. This compared, now we were the best uh, OSHA state program in the country when I came on board. That was when Jerry Brown was our young governor. Now, we're about the worst. Kind of, kind of uh, parallels our education system. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Fed OSHA has one for every 60,000 workers. Uh, Washington State has one for every 30,000 workers. Oregon has one for every 20,000 workers. We have 200 inspectors. If we had the same level as Oregon or British Columbia, we would have 923 inspectors. We have fewer inspectors, 200, fewer is the number, 200 
is what the number is. They have twice that many fish and game inspectors in California. That's what's happened to our worker health and safety state program, state OSHA program. Now the good news. Recently, two years ago, a standard was passed which is called aerosol transmissible diseases or pathogens. What Becky uh, found in her, you know, in her circumstances in Connecticut with fi the Pfizer lab would have been covered by this standard totally. It is an excellent standard. Those of you that have pencils, you should get hold of this standard because if any problem comes up to your workplace and you contact OSHA for the lab workers, you want to have this standard to say, hell, you get out there and do something, you're required to do it. So the standard is, the standard is as aerosol transmissible diseases, it's in the General Industry Safety Order, number 5199. Now how do you get to that on the computer? Well, I use Google. I may change that soon because of what Google's doing. But <laughs> you, you Google Cal OSHA GISO, General Industry Safety Order. Then you go to section 5199, click on that, group 16, article 109, and you will get to the total standard and you can print it out. It is an excellent standard and it covers novel or unique agents such as recombinant DNA viruses and that Becky was working with, the lentivirus, and it covers all of the all of the unique no novel viruses and agents, microagents, that are going to be used in making synthetic fuels, and making pharmaceuticals, and making pesticides such as David experienced. They're using it making plastics. It's mind-blowing. I was talking to Steve the other day and I said, what are they producing that's of real usefulness, that's yes. unique, that really helps mankind, that really helps uh, you know, our communities, and we came to the conclusion, and I can back this up with a lot more talking, they produce nothing yeah. that couldn't have produced by old-fashioned, good in medicine, good epidemiology, fighting the agent, culturing it out, and then going into public health measures to prevent its transmission. Uh, finally, uh, one, more, one more point I want to make is that we've all, we all came to the conclusion, those that were most committed in my agent, agency came to the conclusion the only way that workers in the biotech industry are going to get a good functioning health and safety program is by getting organized. They have to have a union, they have to have a representative, a shop steward there, and they have to defend the people who are in charge of health and safety so they don't get canned and, and dumped on. Thanks. Okay, thank you. The largest number of workers, uh, biotech workers who are organized at the University of California Upton, CWA, and they're right now fighting the case in which one of their members was killed or died in a laboratory at UCLA because of the lack of health and safety protection, and the regents of the university and the supervisor are being sued as a result of that. So we also have with us David Bell, who is a biotech worker at AgriQuest, uh, which is in Davis, it's owned by Pam Marone, who came from Monsanto, and it was uh, engineering pesticides, uh, genetically, genetically engineering pesticides. So David, uh, maybe you can talk about, uh, do you believe your lab was safe at uh, AgriQuest, and what happened to you there, briefly? Um, well, if people could stand up, it's hard for people to see. Then you can't speak. No, you can't speak. Okay. You can hold yeah. Oh, maybe you could sit there. Or, or you could stand over here. Okay. No, no, no. It's going to be too much. It's going to be too much. Okay. Okay. Use this. This is on. 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 My name is David Bell. Um, I work for a startup company in Davis, California. It was uh, originally spun off at UC Davis. So, oh, so oh, 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 closer. There you go. Okay, this, this is almost as bad as American Idol. Uh, <laughs> did I think I was safe when I worked there? Um, when I first started, I was a senior in college. Oh. I absolutely thought I was safe. 
Uh, I was told by my college professors before I began working there that as a scientist that we had pretty much the safest job in the world. <laughs> that if we ever got ill, that our brethren, our doctors, everyone who are all other biologists would do anything they could, that the CDC would isolate it, and that they would try their best to cure us. Um, I work doing, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. It kind of, it's drifting for me, so I can't really hear it. Um, I worked in two projects. One of them was a, a biofungicide, and the other one was a, a mosquito larvicide. Uh, the mosquito larvicide was my main project. The biofungicide was uh, developed because the marketplace wants organic food, and in order to produce organic foods, we need pesticides and fungicides for organic food that are certified organic. So, so the only way we can do this is to come up with fungi and bacteria to apply to your food in the field. Um, the one we worked on was a cousin of anthrax. Uh, it can survive autoclaving, so it would maybe be able to survive your oven or your stovetop. Um, yeah, I thought I was safe. I thought I was safe because my teachers told me that, because the people I were working with were associated with the University of California Davis, which had credibility, because the research was associated with credibility, and these people have PhDs. Uh, I mean, they had a higher education level than I. So I, I definitely assumed I was absolutely safe. Oh yeah, I got sick. <laughs> what happened? What happened? What happened? <laughs> Briefly, I was at work one day on a Tuesday, and I ended up in surgery in less than a week. Uh, sinus, infection, unknown organism, had surgery, started with the first one, ended up with four surgeries, now um, a portion of my immune system is turned off. I have an acquired immune deficiency, it's not the one everybody thinks about in the Bay Area. Um, where it came from, whether it's spontaneous or whether it's related to the actual employer, is an interesting question. That's a question I have myself. We know the answer. And one of the things about <laughs> one of the things about the the nightmare, the nightmare that, that workers face, not just biotech workers. Uh, but especially biotech workers, is you have to prove where you've been injured and if you've been sickened. And David was not able to get workers comp because his employer denied it. And he went to court and he went through a whole appeal process and it was denied. And his mother, uh, who's with us, Sandy Trent, actually had to discover that there were actual financial conflicts of interest uh, in regard to him getting the health care that he needed to deal with his injury. So welcome, Sandy Trent. Thank you. Uh, the conflicts of interest started with the doctor. We didn't find that out until David's just before his second sinus surgery, three years apart from his first one. He said pre-op, uh, three times repeatedly, I want this culture. I think I got something in the lab. He said this in front of witnesses. Just before the second sinus surgery in 2002, he said, uh, what did you find in the cultures? She said, oh, I forgot to culture. All right, we find out after the fact is that she has hospital privi privileges, this doctor, surgeon, out of the same hospital system that the CEO founder of AgriQuest sits on the board. Number one, conflict of interest. Number two, conflict of interest. Well, there's a whole lot of conflicts of interest, but as far as David's concerned, 2007 was his workers' compensation trial. Just before the trial, the judge was changed. We go into court, there's a judge. Gee, that's not the judge that's on the papers. She says, you did not receive a workplace injury or illness, and you shall receive nothing by way of your claim. This was 2007. In 2010, I find out that her husband, this judge, worked with, well not worked with, but worked with a company that had direct ties to the defendants in the case. In 2000, David tried to get his workers' con or his employee file. He was told, or he, he never received it. The only time he received it was in 2004, after a subpoena. The conflict of interest with the judge's husband also goes to that law firm. 
all kinds of conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. No, no. David, David, uh, David Bell still does not have health care. So this is the problem. You have to prove. I mean, uh, one of the issues this raises is uh, for biotech workers, nanotech workers, for synthetic biology workers, if they get injured under workers' comp, they have to prove where they've been injured. If you can't prove where you've been injured, you don't get workers' compensation. The difficulty, it's almost impossible to prove with new genetic diseases what you have. Which means we have a whole category of workers in California and the United States who are not eligible for workers' comp because they can't prove where they were injured. They can't show where they were injured. So they basically end up on Social Security, and that's how David survived, or they end up dead. That's what's going on with injured workers in biotech. So our next uh, question is, uh, the, one of the systemic problems with the with confidential information and trade secrets and proprietary secrets, and I think uh, maybe one of you want to address that? Address that, right. Okay. Which, which my point? Okay. <laughs> okay, my, my particular field is actually regulated with FISRA, okay, because I worked in pesticides. It's a federal insecticide, fungicide, roadside act. It's uh, considerably more specific over the EPA. There was no enforcement. There were tons of violations over what was recommended, what would actually be right to the farm worker. But when it came to a laboratory worker, they violated left and right. There was no enforcement whatsoever. OK, we have uh, one other question, and that is the question of college uh, or university laboratories. And, and with us is Joni uh, um, Chow and her husband, uh, Malcolm, uh, died in the laboratory, and uh, even after dying, she had to fight to get the documentation from the agency. Spend should talk briefly about that. Hi, um, I'm here. I just I wanted to talk about several aspects about the death of my husband, Malcolm Casadevan. Um, his his death occurred in a very tragic way, and also, almost uh, the most ironical way too. Um, there were. Three, there are about four or five things I wanted to, to comment. First of all, Malcolm has been a faculty member uh, at University of Chicago for at least 30, 40 years. And also, he has served on the Institutional Biosafety Committee for over 10 years. And those meetings occur every month, and they do roll calls, and uh, Malcolm's always on there, and they uh, Malcolm, together with 10 other members, they instituted all the biosafety regulations and rules that's been practiced at the University of Chicago. And long and behold, he, he died uh, by very simple violation uh, uh, rules that he set at the university. Uh, Malcolm's also been a very experienced uh, microbiologist. Uh, he had his training from Harvard, uh, uh, Harvard labs, from John Becker's lab. And Malcolm is considered a very experienced microbiologist uh, from John Beckwith uh, lab. And uh, after he after he died, the university uh, is saying, "Oh, his death is uh, his death was uh, was most mysterious way. They have no idea how it happened. They have no cause of uh, death. They have no route of infection." They have no port of entry, whereas all those informations were in the autopsy report. Mm -hmm. And this is true with the, the only publication that came from CDC where they reported. Uh, I also wanted to uh, basically touch base that at the time when, when his, that his death occurred, uh, the lab was operating one of the nine national labs put up in a biodefense contract. Now, biodefense was put in, uh, was instituted since uh, Bush time, uh, Bush administration, and was given about $150 million uh, uh, to these labs. And these labs act like a little NIH or NIAID that pass all these funds to local labs. So Malcolm, at that time, was doing experiments under the biodefense grant, and that, uh, then he, uh, one of the agents that they study in the biodefense was uh, plague, and he was killed by plague. Plague that in the medieval time that killed 
so many European people and, and uh, was uh, the Black Death. Now, uh, for the two years that CDC and, and FDA and NIH were investigating, they came away with saying, oh, this is a mysterious death. Uh, they don't know what happened. It was a lab uh, accident. They also blame uh, Malcolm for his own fault, for not adhering to, to biosafety rules. But I have investigated, uh, uh, which is not the truth at all, because Malcolm died from septicemia death. And you know that's the deadliest uh, infection that can occur from, from, uh, from plague. And secondly, the autopsy report says the port of entry is through oral, through oral ingestion. Basically, someone had pushed it down his throat and, and, and get down to the intestine. From intestine, the bugs, the, the plague can adhere, uh, adhere to the intestinal wall and basically gain entry into the bloodstream. The, in, this type of infection can only occur uh, or can occur internally. It doesn't leave any marks outside. Septicemia uh, plague infection can be caused by two ways. One is by oral ingestion by the person. And the second way is by um, intravenous ingestion. But of course, intravenous injection, if you give someone into the blood, into their blood, you will leave a mark, a wound, open scab uh, on your body, and Malcolm had no open wounds. So the whole uh, course of infection was hidden from him. He didn't even seek doctor's advice. He didn't even tell the doctor he was working on this uh, plague. And, uh, and Malcolm is a, a very experienced researcher. He wouldn't. He, all his life, he, he was very careful about what he takes in. He doesn't drink coffee, he doesn't drink tea, he doesn't drink any of the things, and he doesn't take sugar, and long behold, he was killed uh, orally uh, by this bug. This, and the reason that oral infection through this is the deadliest infection is because this particular pathogen that he was infected with was the dangerous pathogen uh, of all time. It was reported that that pathogen, a similar strain, was being used in Russia, in Madagascar, and they caused uh, quite a bit of illness because uh, in those reports, that reports written by Professor Tipball in Europe has stated that that, uh, that the agent, even though they, they think it's a reduced virulence, but it can actually kill a lot of people. But at that time, they did a sub-Q uh, infection to people in Russia and also uh, they did a, a lot of studies on US servicemen in Asia um, they didn't have too much time or analysis on um, okay they didn't have too much time in terms of diagnosis of death so basically uh, I wanted to, to, to just say that uh, his death is not really mysterious mm -hmm. it's what's co being covered up by, by <coughs> University of Chicago and also by uh, CDC and, and several NIH agencies. Now, his death has raised a public, you know, raised a lot of issue with public safety because uh, his death was not uncovered by, by the university. It was the family member who asked autopsy to do this. So basically, anyone, when he was in the ER room and everything. It's not a thing. Okay, so, <laughs> so the public health was at risk because people that came in contact with him and was not was not notified. And also because CDC covered up, and then there's another laboratory infection that occurred two years down the road. And uh, so after this, I believe NIH has withdrawn a grant. So this is a tragic story that, that I have taken. And um, the way that I have gone about it is that NIH, CDC have provided most of the documents to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, and these panels will be available for comments or questions uh, from the audience. So our next uh, panel, Health, Justice, Communities at Risk with Eric Hoffman. Welcome to the Cool. Thank you much, Steve. Um, so we have the honor of closing out the presentations for tonight. That also means that we have uh, only a couple minutes to do so. so I apologize. <laughs> Thanks for your patience in sitting through all this, and I apologize for the panel. I'm going to have to be brief. I'll ask you about a prior questions, and then we'll just move on to Andy. So Andy will give you the same guy to go too long. Um, I'm going to start things off with uh, Dr. Henry Clark, the director of the 
West County Toxics Coalition. Hey. So Dr. Clark, I know, I think everyone knows Richmond's history and um, the environmental injustices that have happened, um, particularly with toxic dumps and chemical dumps as a result of the synthetic chemistry industry. Um, why should folks in Richmond be concerned about the, the upcoming synthetic biology industry? Thank you. Uh, well, I'm concerned, and the uh, West County Toxic Coalition and our members and other people in the community is concerned for many reasons. First of all, I think that uh, the uh, city of Richmond has sort of put itself out front on the limb in terms of making a big hoorah of inviting the lab mm -hmm. there to Richmond in the first place, knowing that there was uh, many questions concerning the lab and what type of research the lab was going to be uh, doing there, and those questions were not uh, answered at the time that the uh, city of Richmond did the big reception and put banners and welcoming banners all around uh, the uh, uh, civic, civic center. I think that that was uh, uh, premature. What we're dealing with, in my assessment, is a situation where the city of Richmond, as well as many other cities and counties, are having financial problems and they need taxes and they need jobs and the law was looked at as a cash cow to bring in jobs uh, and tax revenue. Uh, I think that that was a big mistake uh, because of the fact is, is that we are already dealing with that site, that area where the lab is proposed uh, over there, what we call the Zeneca site, the Zeneca Chemical Company, which was former Stauffer. Uh, there's a community advisory panel that I'm one of the members of that's uh, been trying to clean up that site for years. We don't know what's there in terms of chemicals. We know that there's radiation there. Here again, the Department of Energy did a uh, secret type of uh, research there uh, during the 40s when there was seaport housing projects uh, housed by primarily uh, black people there uh, in the South Richmond area. We don't know what their period and can't get any definitive answers right now with the present situation. So we're going to invite in the lab to add more fuel to the fire to say just trust us because with the lab, I don't think so, period, period. We need some real answers. We need we need some real answers, uh, uh, full answers. We need some full uh, disclosure, a uh, 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 period, uh, in terms of what's gonna, what is being proposed there. All these questions that people are raising, this is like deja vu. Uh, the uh, regulatory agencies are, are covering up the same way they do with Chevron, the health department and officials, no matter what level uh, that you're on, the local health department, all the way up to the uh, 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 National Institute of Health and all those between. You know, you can complain about cancer clusters uh, all over the place, but, uh, you know, no answers. Well, it's not because of Chevron. It's not because of this chemical company. You know, you're probably doing something, and you're probably smoking too many cigarettes or something. <laughs> or blame the victim type of nonsense. Or when you start asking questions to try to get a clear sense of what's happening, well, you know, that's a trade secret. The same old nonsense, period. We don't need that, and we're not going to go for the okie doke this time. We want some clear, definitive answers, period. You know, otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, you could take it somewhere, not take it somewhere else. You could just forget about the idea because of the fact is, is that And if it's not broke, then why are, you, why are you trying to fix it? Well, you know, here are these companies, uh, uh, they uh, give us all this here uh, nudity food that's uh, not the, all the nutrition that have been taken out of it, you know, and then come back, well, you sick. Yeah, we're sick from eating this here bleach food and stuff that you didn't uh, uh, devitamize, and now you want to make some pharmaceutical stuff to heal us after you done made us sick. You know, uh, come on, you know, what type of, you know, we're not uh, 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 stupid. We don't need 
none of this type of nonsense. The fact is, is that if Richmond wants some jobs, Richmond should uh, invest in renewable energy technology. You can make more jobs than the lab could ever produce in solar technology and wind energy technology, period. Richmond brag about being a, a site during the uh, 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 war efforts are, are, are producing the Liberty Ship, the Liberty Ship and, and munition factories to go and kill people and they brag about that. Well how about investing in some renewable energy to save the planet, to fight the war against uh, uh, the uh, climate uh, 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 change and, and, and uh, produce some real clean, green jobs if you're really concerned about uh, uh, living by the uh, precautionary principle and environmental justice justice that the city of Richmond have went on record saying that they were all about. This is going to be an uh, important struggle there in Richmond. It's going to really uh, expose uh, who's who yeah. and who's really green. And I said let the chips fall where they may. attorney at Tri-Valley Cares. We're out in Livermore where we've been watchdogging the Lawrence Livermore National Lab since the early 80s. Primarily their nuclear work, 
But then in 2002, they announced that they were now going to enter the biodefense industry and were going to build a BSL-3 level laboratory in Livermore. They also, the Department of Energy also announced they wanted to build a BSL-3 at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, people in the community were really worried about this. It was going to be 300 yards from houses, parks, um, where we all lived out there. And so um, people got together with Tri-Valley Cares and we started a campaign. We hooked up with people in New Mexico who lived around Los Alamos and they also started a similar campaign. Um, we started with petitions, going door to door. Uh, we got over 8,000 petitions signed. We brought them to the city of Livermore saying, see, we don't want this here. And the city said, oh, it's a federal facility. There's nothing we can do. And unfortunately, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is also a federal facility. Yep. It's financed by the Department of Energy. Yep. The city of Richmond has agreed to house it there. There's really going to be not much the city of Richmond can do. Hopefully, they will be more active than the city of Livermore, which is really a company town that has given in to anything the lab wants. Um, and the lab's been there for a long time. Lawrence Berkeley Lab has not been in Richmond for a long time, so that's a significant difference. But um, our next step was to initiate litigation. Now, we decided to do this under the National Environmental Policy Act, again, because it's a federal facility, so we had to sue under federal law. Um, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA as it's commonly called, um, has a wide breadth of coverage. So, um, for example, when they did their environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act, they also had to examine things like non-proliferation and um, security and safety and uh, anything that might harm the community or people. Um, this is really the only vehicle that's available for us to have public input. So there's a public comment period that happens really rapidly. Yeah. Um, and that is the most important time for community members, for experts to get together and make really in-depth expert comments because that is our only opportunity to do so. That you know, two-month period of public comment was followed by 10 years of litigation in Livermore. Okay. And we never got to get anything else on the record that wasn't put on the record during the two-month public comment period. So that time is very important for when that comes up for the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Synthetic Bio Facility. Um, I'm sorry to say that we did end up losing the lawsuit. We did have several victories along the way, including that the fact that they decided to drop the Los Alamos lab, um, or BSL-3 lab. But they built the lab in Livermore, and it's now fully operational, 300 yards from where people live, doing experiments with um, select agents like anthrax and botulism. Um, we do try to continue to watchdog their activities there. Um, however, that is also difficult because the only right to know law that we can use to gain access to information is the Freedom of Information Act. The Department of Energy is notoriously bad at responding to FOIA requests, as they're called. In fact, they take about a year on average to give us information. Information that should really be made public as a matter of course. Um, there's something called the Institutional Biosafety Committee. In Livermore, it meets secretly um, behind the highly secure lab gates. Um, but hopefully here for this lab, the community is sure that the Institutional Biosafety Committee meets in public and that the minutes are made regularly available so that people can monitor the lab if it, does, if it does indeed get built. So I'm happy to take more questions later, but I'll leave it there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So let's just. Sugarcane uh, 
has a lot of different implications. For instance, uh, in this map from Brazil, now I need the other micro. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wow. This yellow uh, here is uh, what is called the Cerrado region. It's a savanna. It's where the agribusiness sector is pushing very hard, and it's the area that the Brazilian government has decided that is adequate for sugarcane. They call it uh, agroecological planning. And uh, then we have the Amazon up here. And uh, the government said that the Amazon would be protected from sugarcane. And this was a few years ago. Now we are already talking about sugarcane in this region of the Amazon here. So the government has issued another planning where it's allowed, uh, it's starting to be allowed to cultivate sugarcane in the Amazon region. So uh, it means, uh, and the, uh, are, uh, the justification they use for that is that it's empty land. It's not marginal land, it's not bad land, it's empty land. No one lives there, just indigenous people and some regular people, but it's empty, you know, so go ahead and plant as many, much sugar cane as it's possible to do. Uh, and another situation uh, in Brazil is that uh, the process of sugar cane, the harvest, is mainly done by workers. And uh, to be able to harvest it, uh, it has to be burned before, otherwise it's too difficult because it's too heavy, too many leaves, so uh, this burning means a lot of uh, emissions, and it means uh, climate change, it means uh, global warming, and uh, it means uh, labor that is very similar to slave labor. These workers, they are called boyas frias, and that means coal mill, because that's the way they can eat, they can uh, work. And they are paid not because of uh, time of working, but because of how much they uh, harvest. And they have to harvest from 10 to 15 tons per day to earn their living during the month. Otherwise, they don't make enough money. And it's a tough job, uh, you know, it's uh, very unhealthy because of smoke and uh, all the ashes and so on. And. Uh, the plans for, for the government is uh, to have something, or well, they, it was to have something the size of 1.5 Californias with sugar cane cultivated in the country. They came down to this uh, figure some time ago, but the, uh, last month uh, the government has set up a program to finance about five million hectares of uh, sugar cane, and that is more or less about 12% uh, of California area, just in three years' time. So uh, it's pushing a lot because many of the companies that Jim has mentioned working here in this region with Scientec Biology, they are in Brazil with Brazilian partners and foreign partners to develop Scientec Biology because it's the easiest way Today is with sugar cane. Thank you. Thank you. We've heard a lot of information tonight, and we've gone from the hyper local to the immediate lab workers to the global implications. And Maddie has one person to tie, tie this all together to be Go Paul for movement generation. So I think we're, we're lucky to have him here. So Go Paul, can you just uh, All right, I'm going to I'm going to do this in like 30 seconds. <laughs> um, uh, so my name is Gopal, I'm from Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project. Um, uh, how many people here garden? Anybody here garden? Yeah. Does anybody go around their garden with a pair of like uh, scissors and trim the tops of their weeds? Does anybody ever do that? Anybody, anybody think that weeding involves just sort of like clipping around the edges of your weeds? No. How do you weed? You like, you, you get your hand as close as you can to the dirt where the plant meets the soil and you wiggle and you get it, you get it, and you work at it and you pull it out. And what's the first thing you do? You look at the end, you look at the very tip. And you look for that tapered, tapered, very, very little end, right? And the finer that point, the closer you have to the end, the, the, the more satisfied you are because you know it's never coming back, right? And the thing you're really looking for is the seed. Because if you got the seed, you got the weed, right? And the take-home lesson here is you gotta step really way back first and really look at the full picture. 
The stories that get told about all of these things, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Chevron oil refinery, the Lawrence Livermore Berkeley Laboratory Synthetic Biology Project, the story that's told is simple, small, narrow, and contained in order to control what you see. What you, what you see is the story of a green fuel that's going to replace oil, right? But when you start to step back, you start to see the bigger picture, which is the loss of land and livelihood in Brazil, the destruction of mangrove forests in, uh, in Nigeria. You see the collusion of, of uh, corporate interests and, uh, and um, in this public-private partnership that leads to promise, promise, and more promises. So I want to provide just a few thoughts about next steps for, um, for the moment we're in. I'll skip all the other stuff. First is what I just said. We need to think in terms of life cycle assessment. This, this is about the lab in Richmond, but it's, and it, this is about synthetic biology, but it's also about the much bigger picture and being able to, to look at all of it as one big thing and to be able to see that, right? So in our analysis of what we want and what we need, let's look at the whole picture and the implications for everyone along the chain of production or, in this, or the chain of destruction. We need a precautionary principle. If you think it's gonna hurt people, you need to prove it's safe first. Absolutely. There's no reason to do things we don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Like yeah. we, need, we need public money for public benefit. Um, and, um, and without the polluting effects of profit. Public money is for public benefit. This is a public institution. We should have public oversight and public control over what kinds of work happens in these places and what the outcomes are. They should be controlled by the people and the people's interests. One of the key things that I think um, we haven't really talked about enough here is, is what makes this different from other technologies. And for me, that's about scale. The scale and pace at which the technology has to function in order to be useful. The methodology has to function. And one of the key things that I think we should be calling for is total transparency. That means every single sequence that's created, every single genetic code that goes into a microbe should be published and the reason it was produced explained. Now that gets to this big question of the way it works is producing tens of thousands of them at a time and then picking out the ones that you like and dumping the other ones either in an autoclave or hopefully not on, down the sink or in people's clothes. Mm -hmm. Let's slow the process down to the kinds of deliberative methodologies that lead to intentional outcomes, not the kind of random mass-based methodologies where you just uh, sort and stratify. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, um, and the last thing I've been told to say five or six times, I'll raise your hand if you ever heard of Fukushima. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't put nuclear power plants on the edge of the ring of fire, and you certainly as hell should not put synthetically engineered novel life forms on the edge of the ring of fire. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Very efficient done there. <laughs> Save us some five or ten minutes here for questions. I have your questions here that have been randomly selected <laughs> for discussion. Um, so here's the first question uh, you know, from the audience here. What actions are being taken now to require existing Symbio labs in the Bay Area to follow more stringent safety protocols? Let's not wait until the new lab in Richmond is up and running four or five years. Let's do something now. Anybody on the panel want to? Address what's going on now. I think I know the answer to this one. But to... Go for it. <laughs> well, the answer is uh, there are no safety regulations for that. Uh, and uh, particularly, you know, whatever uh, guidelines there are uh, for the federal government don't apply to private corporations, uh, and they're not enforced at the federal level either. So uh, I think, uh, but I think it's an excellent question. Uh, because a lot of the dangers we're talking about are ongoing now. This is not something that's happening in the future. If you're in Emeryville, it's happening at University Left right now. So uh, if that activism doesn't have to wait. Uh, it, it, it can be in your community next. Um, there's another uh, question that was asked earlier in the day in our, in our day session today. Why are deadly organisms, and we were talking about Yersinia pestis, the plague, talking about the anthrax, snake venom, all these things. Why are they being experimented with as bioweapons? Why is that being done? 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 Is this working? I could add 
to the, the, the last question, though. Um, actually, uh, today the federal government announced a new policy with respect to biosecurity, and um, there are actually no new responsibilities for any local labs, so um, more of the same. Uh, uh, why are we doing this? Well, I, obviously, post 9-11, more than anything, you know, resulted in, a, in an increase in the biodefense budget from about you know, uh, something south of, a, of $100 million a year to, to something around a billion or a little bit less. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the mentality that prevails uh, in, the, in the circle of folks that make decisions about, about biodefense and biotechnology is uh, when they hear stories about, about potential problems, about scary things that could result, probably most of us would react by saying, my gosh, well, that's reason to oversee this research much more tightly. They might react by saying, well, we want to do it first, and we, we, we better investigate that. So uh, the, the mentality that exists, uh, at least for the time being, until we're able to change it uh, in terms of cutting edge biotechnology research, synthetic biology, and pathogens, will continue to be one of actually trying to explore the black side um, or the dark side of it. And, you know, it, it's up to us to try to stop that. Yeah, the uh, Biological Defense Research Program, as it was called, was started by Casper Weinberger in 1982, and they began working on Yersinia pestis in 1984, 1985. The idea was the Russians are going to be making these novel pathogens, so we've got to find, we've got to make them ourselves, supposedly to find a cure, which is a little comical since we haven't found a cure for the common cold. How are we going to find a cure for a genetically engineered virus? Most of us suspected they were, they were being planned as potentially offensive weapons. Uh, fortunately, that program was almost completely stopped through litigation and legislation in 1992-93, uh, uh, but it's, unfortunately after 9-11, that was used as an excuse to start up the entire biological defense research program again, and you can be sure that whatever lab is out there is going to be doing that, uh, doing that defense work again. Um, having done that litigation, I find that very discouraging, but uh, another battle to fight. Very good question here is, well, can, could the panel address the production of um, beneficial Beneficial synthetic biology. We, we, we know there are some some medications that have been produced. Does anybody, uh, Jim, you want to uh, get on that? <laughs> okay. what's, what's, what's the shiny side? We got a lot of shadow here. Yeah, so I, it, it, here's what I can see potentially might be a useful, beneficial use of synthetic biology that you could imagine building synthetic systems to better understand how genetic systems. Even that, I'm not sure. I've had conversations with uh, scientists who say actually that's a, that's a little bit of a red herring, but you know, maybe as a basis of knowledge, I, I could see that. Um, uh, what about uh, can I? Sorry? What about Artemisia? Artemisia. Artemisia. Okay, that's a great example. So um, the, 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 um, the, the poster child for synthetic biology, particularly here in the Bay Area, is um, the Artemisinin project. So this is JP's link again. Um, received $43.5 million from the Gates Foundation uh, to produce uh, a micro yeast in the end that will produce artemisinin, which is an anti-malarial compound. Um, and the argument, of course, is that using, using this, uh, this synthetic um, this production method, you can produce this anti-malarial compound, um, which is currently produced from the artemisia bush, um, and you can produce it in a, in a, in a vat instead. And so Sanofi Event has partnered up with Amaris, and they're going to be producing this next year. Now, there's a couple of things that are that the obvious, you know, that looks like a good thing. And, and certainly, artemisinin is, is a useful um, anti-malarial therapy. Um, however, first of all, we're, we're at the moment, we're at a point, at the point when this was being developed, we had overproduction of artemisinin, artemisia. It then went down, it's gone back up again. And we're now at the point where botanical production of artemisinin is, is pretty much re reaching demand. So it's not very clear that we actually need this. What this does, moving artemisinin production into, uh, into a vat, is it's going to be Czechoslovakia, I think, um, means that rather than thousands of farmers in East Africa providing this and providing livelihoods to those farmers, um, you're going to have uh, one company, Sanofi Aventis, with a vat, mm -hmm. replacing all of those farmers in East Africa. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not just that. Um, what's, what's actually going on there, because I've spoken to um, the, uh, the researcher within the Keating lab who developed this, what they were actually developing was not, and artemisinin wasn't where they were going. What they were trying to do was develop what's known as a metabolic pathway that would allow them to produce a whole class of compounds called isoprenoids. 
And Artem Missening was, was, a, was a sort of charismatic megaphone. They could get $43.5 million from the Gates Foundation for this one particular isoprenoid chemical. But it was just a way of building this pathway. Once you've built this pathway and patented this pathway, you can then produce uh, 20,000 different isoprenoids. And that's exactly what Amaris did. They took $43.5 million of philanthropic money, and they used it in order to build a business that was not only going to make biofuels and rubber, because they're working with Genico, and um, uh, squalene, which is uh, for cosmetics, and, 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 and a number of others. Um, this isn't really about artemisinin. The best way to, to produce artemisinin is with farmers in the developing world where people have malaria. That's the best place to be producing artemisinin, and it works. And this is about producing an industrial platform for, for chemical production for Amaris so that they could partner with Total and, and um, uh, big rubber production companies like Genico. And there was nothing to do with that. So I, I think it's a red herring. I would note, as Anna mentioned earlier, uh, that um, also that you know when you look back at prior technologies, including genetic engineering, which first produced insulin uh, in bacteria, uh, and that was supposed to be you know heralded a whole new a whole new era of medicine, which hasn't happened, has been noted. We have to be careful and remember that no technology has been limited to its beneficial uses, but to the contrary. The early beneficial uses. If you open the door for one beneficial use, everything else comes through the door. And again, we've seen that nuclear technology, chemical technology, you name it. But you know, so we, it's a good thing to remember. I've been asked another question. Says, how many people here are from Richmond? Show of hands. How many people from Richmond found this to be helpful as far as information? Uh, another question here is uh, a difficult one, um, which is uh, there's a NIMBY, people know what NIMBY means, right? Not in my backyard. If this lab is not built here, wouldn't it just be built somewhere else? Coming back to better. And uh, so that's a difficult question. And again, as somebody mentioned earlier, there's NIMBY, and then there's NOPE, right? Not on planet Earth. We, we know in Brazil, <laughs> uh, uh, in Africa, it's the, uh, so communities here need to relate to those communities because we are one world community after all. But does some, somebody else want to talk about NIMBY versus NOPE and all that sort of thing? I'll just take a quick, what well, you just said, the best part, which is NIMBY versus NOPE, but, um, or NIMBY and NOPE. I think you actually should be NIMBY. You don't want it in your backyard, but then you don't want it in anybody's backyard or else you're a jerk. Um, uh, and then, um, I mean, right? Like, yeah, you don't want that. Um, but um, I think, I think that actually the interesting thing about the lab is that it's a confluence of a whole bunch of different issues coming together in this one particularly um, disturbing way that I think it gives us an opportunity. It's a new platform in the Bay Area for us to talk about some of the really big issues um, on the edge, on the horizon of what's, uh, what's happening, what's coming. And I think I want to get just quickly say as a part of that back to something that Ignacio said right at the beginning. Some of this is, is mirage, is smoke and mirrors, but the thing that isn't is the massive concentration of resources and wealth. And if that bubble bursts, it's not going to, um, it's not going to burst and then like rain confetti on Richmond or Berkeley or Oakland or anywhere else, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to have economic consequences. It's speculation, right? You have to speculate to accumulate. But most of us know that speculation is bad for the economy, it's bad for relationships, and it's bad for the environment. So that, I think, is the bigger picture. What are the questions we have to ask to get it out of the realm of like fantasy promises and into the realm of the, the real and the practical? Uh, very quickly, in the you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, the federal government was intent on building an enormous new level four facility, maximum containment facility to replace uh, Plum Island. And there was a, a quote unquote competition across the country for uh, different universities basically that wanted it. And, and a coalition of us, including Tri Valley Care, Livermore was interested in it for a while, you know, fought this there, 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 there. It's going right to this question. Ultimately, the losers were Kansas. Yep. But I tell you what, that facility, because of the enormous opposition that occurred in North Carolina, in Georgia, in California, all over the country, um, it has not been funded. It's been, they've just been dribbling money into it, it looks like right now. 
it may ultimately not be built. So it doesn't. So if it, if it doesn't go to you know Richmond, it doesn't necessarily mean it goes somewhere else. And if and if the opposition is is you know vocal and strong, that I think it can have effect. It certainly did in the case of this other facility called Enbath. And that's certainly true in the case of uh, genetic engineered crops in this country through uh, litigation, through grass succession, we stopped genetic engineered wheat, genetic engineered rice, genetic engineered biopharmaceuticals, bio genetic engineered potatoes, genetic engineered tomatoes uh, for five, five and a half years, genetic engineered alfalfa. And surprisingly, no other country in the world has taken those up. So uh, they, they were stopped. Here, here's a very, uh, another very interesting question, which is how, uh, how does the uh, incidence of accidents in bio labs compare with that of other industries? And the second question, which is, I, I, the question is brief, is how do you propose to study infectious diseases in hopes of curing? I think behind that is, without this kind of research, how would you, are there other strategies to explore infectious diseases that would not, uh, that would not involve those kinds of risks? Um, so I don't know if, uh, if Becky or, or uh, anyone want to take that? Okay. Well, I can take well, the problem is they're not tracking acquired, uh, laboratory acquired infections, so there's no way we can compare the uh, rate of laboratory illnesses to normal, you know, incidents in industry. It's a big problem. It's a big problem about transparency and. That's what we're trying to break the barrier of, of trying to get more transparency that these problems are occurring and somehow get it, uh, get it recorded either through workers' comp or through some occupational registry or something. But even, we can't even get adequate uh, transparency through workers' comp. It, it's, a, it's a major problem. Um, so. Even if you don't know exactly, what are the numbers that you do know? Uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, there's a Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, and there is a requirement that uh, injuries and illness be recorded. It's called the 1033 form in every workplace. Trouble with labs is that a lot of these infections go undiagnosed. If, if there was a functioning OSHA program, they would have doctors on board that would require that the suspected cases go to practitioners that know about infectious diseases and would do the proper medical workup. And that's not happening. I was the last remaining doctor on Calvish, and there's a half-time doctor there now, but she is not involved in enforcement in any significant degree. So OSHA has to have doctors on board that will refer to doctors who can do the proper workup and recognize these infections. I think to answer that question, I think you really have to appreciate just how unsophisticated the system uh, of oversight uh, for biological laboratories actually is. Uh, we have very poor numbers uh, as a result. Uh, we have much better numbers uh, when it comes to things like toxic chemicals. Uh, but the agencies that, that uh, oversee things like toxic chemicals uh, with OSHA do not have specific regulations uh, when it, with regards to biotechnological lab laboratories. These are the enforcement agencies. Uh, the non-enforcement agencies like the NIH, which have much more sophisticated uh, regulations, they have no oversight and, uh, and no enforcement power. So you have, this, you have this situation where the enforcement agencies uh, are unsophisticated uh, and have insufficient uh, uh, regulations in place, and you have the agencies that are more sophisticated with no oversight and no enforcement mechanisms in place. So you sort of, you, what, what you've happened when you say, well, there's never been, you know, there, there's, uh, there's less accidents or there's more accidents. We really don't know the numbers because there's no oversight. So, so it's, 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 uh, it's completely inappropriate to, to talk, really to talk about numbers. In fact, it really benefits uh, the proponents of the lab to talk about numbers because the system benefits the lab, right? I mean, the system that's, that they've created is, has such a lack of oversight that there's such an inefficient amount of numbers, we just don't know how bad the problem is. We know enough to know that the problem is widespread. We know enough to know uh, that there's been, as I said, 1,500 infections in biolabs uh, across the country resulting in 36 deaths. The experts themselves say that that's a, a huge underestimation. So the truth is, is that 
both the lab, the lab proponents and, and us. We really don't know how bad the problem is. We simply know enough to know that the problem is, is there and that the problem is severe. Just one comment. When I became ill and asked for my exposure records, remember, I was denied legally. So if you're denied legally, you can't, those of you molecular biologists or synthetic biologists know that to get tested, these are new agents. You have to have the genetic code to get tested. Well, what a trick. Trade secrets supersede your right to get those. You can't get tested, can't 100% can't prove, because when you go to court, or you go to workers' comp, the threshold is super high. Super high. So you're, you're not counted. You're not counted. I had, uh, uh, those people that understand molecular biology, I did have a partial sequence that had a, a smoking gun functional proof that my illness had a direct correlation to my exposure through a scientific genetic code still wasn't enough proof for uh, the courts. So it's a cover-up. It's part of the system. We're battling a system problem. Yeah, what do we do? I, I just have to say something real quick. I'm sorry. Please do. Okay, I will. Okay, the company that my son worked for made one claim of $756. I went before the uh, assistant district attorney in Sacramento, and I said, you know, I wonder if this is one claim that they're saying after OSHA notified them how, what, how safe that they were. This district attorney workers' compensation fraud unit said, you don't have to report everything, but I was saying, geez, I wonder if that's when uh, metal flew in my son's eye and he was taken to the emergency room by one of the employees. Okay, there's number one, district attorney workers' compensation fraud unit. Okay, now you've got Yolo County, which is involved in this also. Yolo County District Attorney Investigator Strosky admitted before the California Depart Department of Insurance Insurance Fraud Commission, or Workers' Compensation Fraud Commission, gee, I'm not really sure what employees' rights are. Um, gee, I have to admit, Yolo County has been rather negligent in that area. Now, these are people that are supposed to enforce the laws for workers. Anybody that goes to work in the state of California, you're not safe. Your government is gonna protect you, your county is not gonna protect you, and the state is not gonna protect you. There's no enforcement. I, I, one other point, look, we, we don't have national health care. So workers have to prove where they've been injured. On top of that, they cannot prove in the biotech industry where they've been injured. These companies, when you ask, how many workers have been injured in this company? No. They can't tell you. They won't tell you. They don't have to tell you. So if we're going to allow these companies to, to build factories where workers can't say how many people have been injured, is there a systemic problem? They say, screw you. I say, screw them. Yeah. If, they can't, if they can't say how many workers have been injured in the biotech industry because they have secrecy agreements, they have privacy agreements, and workers are threatened with being sued, they don't have a right to do business. That's right. Because it's a public health safety right. issue. Not only for the workers there, but the public. How are you going to know that there's a systemic problem if you can't get the figures? If we can't get the figures in California, in Connecticut, any state in the United States, we can't get the figures. That is something that has to be raised publicly in all these is all these hearings. Where are the facts? Where are the figures? And they won't tell them. That's Ask Obama. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Easy now. Easy now. Crowd is getting ready. I would make one more comment, and, and uh, you know, if you break your arm, God forbid, you should break your arm, you know, in a, in a work, work accident, you don't go back to your neighborhood and everyone else has a broken arm. Uh, but when you bring home a pathogen, it doesn't stay in your body. The entire community, your family, the entire community is at risk. So that makes these kinds of assets very, very different than those in other kinds of industries because it, it could affect not just your family, the entire community, and eventually even as Ed was pointing out, a uh, potential pandemic. So that is a real qualitative difference between these. Um, I have a, a question here saying, what should the 80%, I'm not sure this figure is accurate, but maybe it's not so this is good for you. What should the 80% of graduate students who are not going to become faculty members <laughs> do to uh, 
to make sure that science is done for the benefit of society and, and, and not simply become, I guess, pawns of industry. So, that's too difficult a question to, uh, to answer. Uh, the one thing is that you're very generous in assuming that 80%, 20% of the students will become faculty members. It is really a question of public in public interest, and the the uh, few among us who are lucky and privileged to have a position of responsibility as a faculty member do have that responsibility. But I think it is a question of public interest, of public responsibility, and where the public has been left out by this uh, supposed privilege given by academic freedom, an abuse of academic freedom, which is a privilege given by the public for us to deal in freedom. It is abused as some kind of right to secrecy that has been abused and given away so that what used to be business secrets is, are now covered under academic freedom and the, and the messing of that, the mixing of that, is really what has been hurting us all through conflict of interest and conflict of commitment. The, the academic system has become committed to this idea. We cannot but produce more and more and more students with a false promise of a, of a job that will not exist, especially when the bubble bursts. And so it, it becomes really a public problem rather than a private moral, moral problem for individuals. It really is a question of what we as a society are doing to ourselves and especially to those young people to whom we're making these promises. Thank you. I, I think it's fair to know uh, that, um, that one of the reasons the corporations have such power in their funding is because of the drastic reduction of funding by government. Uh, that leaves them open to this kind of uh, blackmail. It's kind of losing their soul, as, as Mr. Nelson said earlier. Um, and so one of the things you can do is, is really make sure and really do everything you can politically to get the government to do what it should be doing, which is supporting a free, open educational system and not one that's corporate passion. Um, we have um, time for one more. Should we have one? This is a so I think this question is sort of like lack of belief. So again, I mean, this is sort of you, Ignacio. So um, <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> how was you know the, I think this is a, how in the VP study that you mentioned that they want to know how in the world did these Berkeley professors how were they selected to do this study that pretty much said that the oil spill was I mean. And I think beyond that is a sort of idea of how did, is there a conspiracy? I mean, those of us who are not, including myself, are not inside academia. I mean, how do these papers get written? How does all how does this sort of thing work? Well, it's, it's self-selecting and self-serving. What happens is uh, with these deals, typically the company puts money into a box in which they choose to have uh, uh, employees from this company, together with some members of the faculty who are selected to be part of a, of a mini NSF, so to speak, to which you can apply for money. So again, people become uh, held to the hope that they might make money out of this little committee. It has been found under hearings of the California legislature that these committees set, held themselves first to the monies, themselves and their labs, because it's the same committees that are funding themselves, and, and then maybe help some of the favorite faculty who will not be problematic and so on and so forth. So it's self-serving and self-fulfilling prophecies of promotion and propaganda through the academic system. Yeah, thank you. I would note, by the way, and some of you need the right number on this, that uh, one of the companies that I spent a bit of my life on, Monsanto, um, has contributed how many millions to the journalism department at Berkeley? Close to one. 21 million? Close to one. No, just one. Million. So they, we journalists have journalists that cheap. They don't have. <laughs> <laughs> the journalists are cheap, I think. So they don't have that expenses. <laughs> so let's see, what, let's, see what, let's see what comes out of the journalism department at Berkeley in the next few years. Um, I want to thank everybody on this panel. This great group of speakers.
Thank you all so much, all of you, for being here. Thanks, thanks, thanks.